Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. It's, uh, it's a great honor to be here. Um, I understood a little. Uh, uh, so let me just add that the, uh, the topic that I'll be presenting today, uh, I did within two years of my postdoctoral fellowship with Ingrid Olson. Um, here she is in an insinuating pose, which uh, could have been a good picture, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, it, the, the, during the period of two years with her, uh, um, I I, I did something that I didn't do throughout my career. This is something on, a, on an entirely different level uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the domain of social, social cognition, social neuroscience. Uh, this chapter is somewhat closed, even though I'm still working on it a, a little bit. Uh, but uh, um, I would usually be talking about multisensory uh, integration and speech perception. But, uh, but I'm excited that, that, uh, that Dave asked me to present uh, what I did during those two years because it's, it's a, for me a little bit out of the audience. Um, well, uh, at the beginning, uh, well, I'm, what is a little bit unusual about this talk is I'm going to talk about uh, a functional anatomical area of the brain rather than rather than uh, the anatomical correlates of a, of, of a particular function. So this this may be at the beginning that this is a little bit uh, unusual, and I, I will also point out to you that um, that the anterior envelopes uh, are a little bit mysterious or enigmatic. Uh, because there is quite some debate about what they are, what they are there to do, uh, and some people believe they don't do much at all. <laughs> so I, my my proposal, my, my soft small proposal to you today, uh, is that the the anterior temples play a, a role or may play a role in in, in social sort of cognition. We will we will learn uh, today what that role may be. And uh, then I will also talk about something uh, that you may have heard about. There is uh, um, an old slash new uh, stimulation technique called transcranial direct current stimulation um, um, that has um, experienced some revival over the last few years and uh, has been, been used in, uh, in, in, in uh, neurorehabilitation uh, um, after after cell loss, after, after stroke. Uh, it's been used in, in, in psychiatric disorders with some success, uh, and even in addiction and uh, weight loss, and, uh, and, and so on and so on. It's, it's, it's being thrown at everything you can imagine right now. And uh, the, you see some positive results, even though uh, uh, it, it, there is some suspicion that what you see is actually all the, all the, all the positive results, right? And the, the ones that are where it didn't work out ended up in the file draw, and, and, and you can see because journals are not interested. Um, I did a few studies with Ingrid, and, and, and unfortunately, this topic needs a little bit of a prelude. So I probably will not get to to discuss the, the uh, another functional I mean, imaging study that I did on the anterior te temporal and the role in the processing of what's called unique entities. And we'll see how far we get. Uh, so what is the enigma about the anterior temporal? First of all, no, did I actually no? I out the picture. Oh yeah, so I, I, I forgot to mention, of course, the anterior temporal sphere. Actually, this is more the temporal pole, broadband area 30, 38 here. The, the anterior temporal lobes are usually more broadly defined as the, as the, as the, the anterior section of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the, the, the temporal lobes here, encompassing more than, than, than just area broadband area 38. If they, some people just talk about the temporal poles, and they usually mean just, just very tip here. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be using a more broad different anatomical. So what is the enigma, enigma about the anterior temporal lobes? Well, uh, actually, this is something that motivated my uh, supervisor, uh, Ingrid Olsen, who studied this. Uh, she was a postdoc at UPenn, and she had uh, a patient with, I, I believe, unilateral uh, anterior temporal lesions. Now, I don't remember what the deficits were, but what she told me was that she was very interested, and she asked a, a, a neurologist about that lesion. She said, so, what can you tell me? Uh, because you very frequently resect this region uh, uh, for, to, to treat otherwise intractable epilepsy. So what kind of deficits do you, do you find? And, and whoever she asks, they say, nothing. It's pretty much an appendix. They, 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 they don't do much. And indeed, there are reviews out there that, uh, that apparently uh, show that uh, you can remove the anterior temporal lobes. Usually, actually, it's one second. This becomes very, very important. Uh, um, you can you can remove one side without much without much effect. And um, I suggest, yeah, there, there, there are effects that may be more subtle than than neurologists uh, would, would, would acknowledge or test for. 
However, now if there is a bilateral damage, as is the case in certain cases of frontotemporal dementia, uh, we see severe semantic deficits. People uh, have a very, very broad, uh, actually there is a, I, I should add, you know, people with frontotemporal dementia have, have, have more problems than just sem semantic problems. In, in, in essence, they forget the meaning of objects. Um, <laughs> there is a subversion that, uh, a, a subtype of, of frontotemporal dementia that apparently or, or supposedly affects uh, only the temporal lobes and to a lesser extent the, uh, the, the frontal lobes. And uh, these, uh, um, the, this, this kind of damage uh, uh, goes along with, uh, with, with very, very broad uh, semantic deficits, a modal semantic deficits. So people cannot identify the meaning or the name of objects and people, no matter in what kind of stimulus modality you present them. And this, this actually has, has motivated one of the most prominent models of anterior temporal function. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, however, if you look at uh, brain imaging studies, the anterior the temporal lobes do show up, and they show up in a, whole, in a, in a large variety of tasks. And uh, Ingrid did that, and she wrote a, a review in, in published in 2007, and I'll be discussing that briefly as well. And um, <clears throat> another thing that should be that, that and maybe added to the, the, the uh, mystery or the uh, enigma of the anterior temples is the fact that the literature, the semantics and, and the dementia literature, the literature on brain imaging, on, on social cognition, uh, they didn't really talk to one another very well. So if you, if you look, maybe in the, it's, it started a little bit in the last two years, but if you look at the literature, that show, that discuss the anterior temporal lobes, they, are, they, they don't mention each other. And uh, this was, for, for me, a major motivation to, uh, to start studying the, the anterior temporal lobes. So now I'll give you a short overview of our theories of uh, anterior temporal function. Uh, I mentioned to you that the most prominent uh, uh, theory uh, is, on, is, is that the anterior temporal lobes are involved in semantic processing and that the evidence comes from patients with frontal temporal dementia with especially with the temporal variant, and what they show is, is, is what's called semantic dementia. Uh, so they, as I said, they have broad semantic and, and impairments in naming and semantic ma matching uh, for many semantic categories, for all sensory uh, modalities, and apparently with the preservation of, with the relative preservation of other cognitive functions. So here's the so-called top model. Uh, so since the semantic impairments are so broad uh, and not sensory specific, uh, they have suggested that the, the anterior temporal lobe serves as something like a hub. Uh, it's sometimes also called the hub and spokes model. So if you look at uh, theories uh, on, on how scientists think that, that knowledge is represented in the brain, one major approach what, what is to think about it in a way that, that uh, uh, the, the, the way things look and what things mean and what you do with them, the, the representation of that is distributed. That means we don't have a, a, a special section in the brain that just does meaning of anything you can imagine. It's basically distributed in the brain. Now, how do we, how do we function if everything is so distributed in the brain? We need, we need a connector, in essence, right? And they have suggested around uh, 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 Timothy Rogers, Matthew Lambert, Ralph, who is one of the mo most prominent uh, proponents of the health model, and uh, 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 um, uh, Patterson, that the, the, the anterior temple serves as this, as, this, uh, as this hub. This is also supported by sparsity, supported by TMS evidence, uh, and, but strangely enough, now there's so, uh, such a huge literature on, 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 on semantics and language, the anterior temporal lobes do not show up that often. There are other areas that show up more often. Uh, areas that we, we, we all know, Wernicke's area, the angular gyrus, the inferior frontal gyrus, progress area, and so on and so on. Uh, but the anterior temporal lobes don't show up so often. And so the initial explanation by Hapwell proponents was that, well, the anterior temporal lobes are located in an area of the brain that, uh, that is near the, 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 the frontal sinuses. So uh, this, these are the areas that experience uh, uh, dropout in imaging studies. And, um, and everybody, uh, many people agree that it turned out that, that uh, it's not so true anymore because actually the anterior temples do show up in the imaging study, just not, just not so much in semantics. And we'll get to that soon. So this is a, this is a domain where they did show up. So uh, there, there is another, there is another um, <coughs> field of, of, of uh, literature that has suggested that the anterior temple 
actually uh, are not are not domain general, not sem semantically general for all kinds of objects and, and, and things and people and, and places. They do they they do people. They 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 connect what we know the names, uh, the way the way people look, the faces, and so on about about people specifically. And the left anterior temporal lobe is supposed to be particularly involved in the in the in the in the naming of people. And there is evidence from Legion and from in the Legion and predominantly in, in the uh, fMRI literature. Now this is very close to uh, the so-called convergence zone model by Damagio. Uh, um, they have suggested, this is actually very close to the hub model, they, but they have suggested that these convergence zones, these, these hubs are actually all over the place, not just in the anterior temporal lobes. But they do say, they do believe that one of those convergence zones uh, are actually located in the anterior temporal lobes. And here's a little bit of a, here's a little bit of a, um, a, a unique theory. So uh, there, there is imaging literature out there that um, that shows that it, it's not just people that uh, or, or known people, or famous people that the anterior temporal are involved in. They also light up when you sh when you show people uh, 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 special places, places that you know, famous places. So they 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 have. Uh, they have proposed that the anterior temporals uh, are engaged when when people are asked to process uh, uh, what they call semantically unique entities, things that are not category, don't fall into broad categories, but are but are only the, the only member of, the, of their own category in essence. So, for instance, here this is this is also called semantic specificity. Uh, so. Uh, um, Human, dog, and object would be would be semantically very broad and not very specific. Uh, politician a uh, little bit more specific. Barack Obama very specific. So in this kind of line of specificity, Barack Obama, Obama would be the unique entity. It's only one Barack Obama. I, I put this here because I did you hear about that? Uh, that the, the the United States Postal Service created a stamp with the, the Sage of Liberty, which is a unique entity. Uh, they used the one in, in Las Vegas. <laughs> It's a quick anecdote. So I mentioned that the anterior temples uh, do light up in a, in a variety of tasks, and uh, this is only part of the, the uh, literature review that I did. Uh, uh, just going through here very quickly, uh, they, they show up in stories of pictorial cartoons involving mental state attributions, theory of mind. Those are, those are mental state attributions. You probably heard about it. I'll uh, talk about it a little bit later again. Social versus non-social gestures, moral judgments, social, social emotional stories. Sounds evoking the social scene, footsteps. So if you hear footsteps of one walker instead of footsteps of two or more walkers, the anterior temple will show up. Music believed by believed to be composed by a human versus a computer. Uh, familiar and famous faces. Uh, lots lots of studies showing this. People's first names and so-called high and zimmer animations. Uh, high and zimmer animations. Uh, I'll show them uh, later on. Uh, I want to explain this here briefly. These are, uh, this, is, this is an old finding, uh, from, it was published in 1944. If you create a few uh, two-dimensional uh, uh, geometric objects, like a, like, a, like a triangle and a circle and, and, and little shapes, and you, uh, you animate them so as if they were interacting with one another, and you ask people what they see, then they uh, uh, spontaneously create uh, a fairly uh, uh, el uh, elaborate narratives of what they see. Uh, without them actually being told that these are supposedly represent something. Uh, I'll show it to you a little bit later. So if you compare these kinds of height and zimmer animations uh, and compare them to, to uh, moving uh, geometric shapes but that don't represent any kind of interaction, you will see that the, that the anterior type of that. I mean, I could confirm this. So now how can we reconcile all these findings? Well, there are three possibilities, at least uh, maybe there may be more. The anterior temporals have functional subdivisions that serve different processes. They are actually a fairly large uh, uh, um, uh, regions of cortical real estate, and it's quite possible that, that actually uh, they, do, they don't do uh, the same thing. And uh, in a, it, actually, the, the, the hub model, as you saw on this little, on this little diagram uh, beforehand, the hub model, if you want to draw it now, would actually be this, this kind of hub center with this kind of domain general uh, uh, hub function. It's actually located on the ventral section <coughs> here, uh, according to the newest studies of, of, of the hub components, and not all over the place. So it is quite possible that there are functional subdivisions. Um, 
So it is also at least theoretically possible that the same neural sub substrate in the RTLs serve different functions depending on the activations of, of other brain regions. So it is, at least in theory, this has been proposed by, by, uh, by, by several uh, um, um, colleagues, uh, that uh, it, the, brain is an, uh, the brain can be flexible. Uh, and, and whatever it does in one region is determined by uh, what other areas in, in, in the brain are, are co-activated. And then the, another possibility is there's a common process. And this could be the common process. It is that they serve a semantic function, but the semantic function is, is specialized uh, in, in social knowledge. And I'll, I'll pitch that to, to you often successfully today. Um, this was not my idea, idea unfortunately. Uh, this was done, done by Zahn in, in 2007 when PNASC published that work. Um, so uh, it is possible that, that all these, if you, if you look at the imaging studies, right, and you want to you you see, if you, if you look at what, what process they have in common, every, every one of them needs, needs a, a social, the understanding of, 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 of social content uh, in a semantic level. And it is possible that this common component here, uh, as I say, is, is, is the ATLs being a, a, a social semantic network, not a general semantic network, but a social semantic network. And there's convergent evidence. Um, so these uh, dementia cases that I was talking about, uh, if you look closely, and this is, this is uh, uh, I wouldn't say widely studied, but, but you see a good bunch of of literature, I'm very gross when I think uh, Penn has, has some of this, is that they, they don't, they, they, People with semantic dementia have more problems than just that. They, they often show uh, uh, social deficits, they, uh, pers personality changes. So this is actually uh, quite known. Now, why they don't, why they are not so apparent if you, in, in resection, it may be the case that uh, the, the, the other, <coughs> the other anterior temporal can compensate for what is lost in the, in the contralateral side to some extent. Um, it has, there's also, also converging evidence from lesion studies in monkeys. Uh, uh, when you uh, resect the anterior temporal lobes on both, uh, both sides in monkeys, they shall show very profound uh, uh, deficits in, in, in interaction, and oftentimes they die because they, 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 are, they are excluded from the room um, and they, uh, they are not able to survive. So, and this is, this is evidence from neuroimaging. This is the study that I mentioned by uh, Roland Zahn, and, and uh, it was at NIH at that time when he did the study with, with Jordan Rathman. And what he did was he showed pick people uh, words, abstract social semantic words. And he let people decide whether these two words are related or not. So um, the subjects performed a, 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 a task that required them to, 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 to judge the relatedness of, of, of words. And then he presented also another condition was non-social semantic words, and they were both very, very well controlled to one another. He, he went through; they were very well controlled uh, in terms of their, their uh, lexical properties. Uh, he went through lengths. Uh, if, you're, if you're interested, you can see in the study in the supplemental material of his PMAS work. Um, and what he could show was that these social semantic words, uh, or the, the social semantic has indeed uh, activated the anterior temporal lobes on one side of the leaf, and it was the, it was the right side. And uh, non -specific, more non-specific middle temporal lobe activation was shown between, uh, um, was shared between social and control words, so a more domain general uh, activation, if you will. So our question was, well, this is the, this is the, the our idea was that uh, that this. Um, social semantic network uh, uh, is the activation of this social semantic network explains why uh, uh, we see activation so so many social cognition studies and here is here is the, the typical uh, not a, uh, not by any means complete but here is a typical uh, uh, social network so if you if you in almost all uh, uh, social cognitive tasks you see you see the especially the medial prefrontal cortex the temporal parietal junction and very often also the anterior temporal lobes light up and our proposal was that, that they light up because uh, social cognitive tasks uh, uh, um, often uh, or mostly uh, uh, need uh, to, to, to access the understanding of, of, of social concepts. And uh, so the prediction was 
And if, if tasks that activate the anterior dental lobes involve social semantic networks, then the activation should overlap in these areas. And uh, this argument, if, if we can show this, this argument would be especially convincing if those tasks that we, that we compare are very different. And this is what we did. Here you see an example of these high and similar animations. We, we found these to be, uh, first of all, uh, very, very different uh, from, from uh, Wuran Zahn's uh, word comparison, but uh, semantic nevertheless, uh, and a, we, we, we believe that they strongly evoke, uh, let's see here, so these are, these are two conditions. This is the high and similar condition here, you see those little uh, shapes running around the box, and if you ask people to describe what they see, they, they, they describe them in, in, terms of, in social, in social terms, there's coalition between two of them, and they attack another, and so the other runs away. And the, the, this one down here, this is controlled for motion, for, for motion characteristics, but uh, does not show movement that would evoke uh, this kind of uh, impression. Um, <clears throat> so our idea was that uh, we present people uh, in the scanner with, uh, with a task like this and a control task like this, and we also had still images uh, uh, as, as a further control task. And um, we asked people to pay attention to these movies and uh, uh, perform a simple task on them <coughs> to decide whether, whether these are all friends and whether these uh, are all, have all the same weight. <coughs> um, and again, here uh, we, we also, as, as kind of, I, I like to involve uh, a sanity test condition in my, in my fMRI test to see. Uh, so I wanted to see whether, whether there are still images, whether the comparison between moving, uh, moving images and still images classic motion processing areas in the uh, in, 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 in area MT. So just as a sanity check, so I, so I know that I did everything right with the simulation. So this was our first task, and this was orthogonal to the other one. Uh, these were di different ones. This is this this is a, the other task that we use, and we use uh, um, uh, Zahn's material for that. Um, so we use the social semantic words here. Uh, we ask people to do the same comparison as uh, or the same judgment on these. As, as they did in design study. Non social semantic words, these uh, uh, very, very well controlled uh, uh, but non social uh, words. And then we also had a, um, a task that we considered non semantic, which is a number task. People had to judge whether the, the first number was, it, was within the plus minus five for each of the other. And the, the way we, this is, a, this is just an image, we reproduce these images to show that we actually have functional covers, coverage in the anterior temple lobes because of the mentioned dropout in, the, in those regions. And we were able to achieve that. It took some experimentation, so we, we, uh, we put people on the scanner on their, on a different, uh, with different uh, uh, pull sequences. And uh, we chose a pull sequence that gave us the maximum coverage in the, in the, uh, in the anterior temple lobes, which involved a very short TE here, this was a major thing, and uh, intermediate voxel size. Uh, TR degree now. Um, so we, we use an, a reach of interest approach. Uh, we, um, we, we took the um, high and tasks and we contrasted them uh, against one another in the, our major conditions, or high and condition, the bumper car condition, and we isolated peak areas in the, in the, in the anterior temporal lobes. And then we ran statistics, uh, statistic, statistical comparison of the activations that were due to social semantics versus control words in the anterior time lobes and saw whether that was significant. So here's my sanity check that I, that I mentioned. Uh, these are the bumper cars versus the still images, and you see here that those, uh, those, uh, those posterior uh, middle temporal areas are, are very active here, and a bit of other things that I can explain now, but that was not the point. Um, so now, um, this is the difference in activation between social movies and bumper cars. And this actually has been shown before. I'm not the first one to do this. And the typical finding is that you see activations all along the superior temporal sulcus, uh, which is typical for, for, uh, for, for other synaptic cars, extending all the way in the, into the anterior temporal lobe. It activates part of the temporal parietal junction and the inferior frontal gyrus, which you also find very often in, in, in synaptic cars. Actually, According to some reviews, it is the most commonly found structure involved in semantic tasks. Um, was it symmetrical? Symmetrical uh, left and right hemisphere? Yes, it was symmetrical, but it was uh, not as strong in the left than it was in the right. 
it was actually surprising how how, uh, how reliable that was. Yeah. These are very oh, these are block designs. These are 15 second uh, movies. So you get a lot of you get a lot of. Uh, it's a very efficient design. You, get a, you have a lot of also you have a lot of a lot of power. Um, and now I'm talking about I'll talk about the word task again. Social semantic versus non semantic words and uh, non-social words versus numbers. And indeed, this is a whole brain uh, uh, analysis here. This is the word test. I'm not going into detail about, about the analysis. I just want to show you the larger picture. We can address more particular questions later, if you like. Um, <clears throat> we see activations in the anterior temporal lobe here, uh, especially in the left. And when, when, we, when we run the, the, the comparison, the statistical comparison, within ROIs, in the in the in the anterior temporal lobes, you see a significant difference in the, in the on the left side, and the uh, you know uh, not significant but somewhat approaching significance on the on the, on the on the right side. So again, I want to repeat here: what we did was we isolated the areas in the anterior temporal lobes on the basic basis on the of the height and similar task, an entirely different task, and then we ran a statistical comparison in this semantic word task to see whether whether there are differences in, in the Anterior temporal lobes, and indeed it seems to be the case. So there are all, there's overlapping activation there, which we interpret as, as being due to, to the activation of social semantic knowledge. Oh, and this of course, it, we, we collapsed here, we use the non social words <coughs> and compare them versus numbers. And if, that, if uh, this is just a, 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 a side note, but if the hub model was true, you would, you would, you would expect here uh, activations there, a semantic versus a you know, close to most non-semantic tests, you would, you, would, you would think that the anterior temporal would, would, would light up, but we didn't, didn't find anything. More so the, the inferior frontal gyrus. Oh yeah, this is, this is a little bit of an ugly image here. I just want to show you that the... the, the, the this is the height and symbol contrast here, this is the word contrast, and this is the overlap in between them. Uh, I believe this was uh, at, a, at, a, at the same statistical threshold. Uh, just to, to just as an illustration uh, that there is overlap in, in, on one side, actually here on the, on, the, on the left, and no overlap on the other. See here, the, those um, <coughs> the word contrast does actually engage the the, the anterior temporal lobe on the uh, uh, on the right side, but it just doesn't overlap with the uh, with the in the contrast. So just uh, as a brief summary. Social and vulgar commonalities activate brain networks involved in motion processing. This is what I, what I said was, that was my sanity check, right? Uh, there was buffer cars versus the still images, so, so I, I was confident that I did the right thing. Um, <clears throat> there were differences in activation between social, uh, um, the social high density movies and the bumper car movies along the superior temporal softness axis and in the inferior frontal cortex uh, along with the uh, temporal parietal junction. Um, <clears throat> we did replicate ATL activation for social versus control words like Zahn showed. And the activation was more prominent in the left uh, anterior temporal. And the activation, and this is our most important finding, this is why we did this whole thing, was that it overlapped in the left anterior temporal. Here's some preliminary conclusions. So, um, I don't know why I, I have to say this again, but we confirmed previous findings of ATL involvement in social semantic processing. Both uh, the social animations and the lexical uh, social tasks involve overlapping neural substrates in the left anterior temporal lobe. So, therefore, it's likely that the activation in high density like animations in the left anterior temporal lobe are due to the activation of social semantic representations in the left anterior temporal So, So, there are a few, there are a few questions that, that I was left with. Um, I was not really confident about the high and similar. Contrast, uh, and I, I was a little bit uncomfortable because uh, there are so many other differences between the uh, Haydn Zimmer movies and the, and the Bomber Cars. Uh, uh, they are not just; they don't just differ in, 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 in some social semantic terms. Um, people form narratives uh, on the stories, in other words, on the on the Haydn Zimmer movies. Now, this alone could be uh, could be a, a possible confound. Um, <coughs> Especially because narratives have been shown to involve the anterior temporal lobes. Um, the other, um, the other idea that I had was that um, uh, observers um, infer mental states uh, like motivations, thoughts, and emotions, and intentions uh, of, of of those little uh, shapes, 
which have an uh, interior of mind, uh, in an interior of mind experience, the anterior temple show up as well. So my question was whether the anterior temporal activity uh, that was invoked by the Heide and Simmel condition was due to the formation of narratives uh, in, in, uh, uh, or uh, maybe um, uh, the formation of uh, theory of mind inferences. And this is what this is a typical uh, theory of mind task here. Um, this is Sally, this is Anne. Uh, Sally has a ball, she puts uh, it into the basket. Sally goes out for a walk and takes the ball uh, um, out of the basket and then puts it, the ball into the box. Now uh, Sally comes back and where does Sally now look for the ball? This is the task for children, uh, a task that has often been used um, uh, in children with autism and uh, children uh, below a certain age uh, do not perform this task. They would say, well, she looks, she looks for the ball in the, in, the, in, in the box here, not in the basket, uh, uh, presumably because uh, the, the, the young child or the, the autistic child cannot uh, put themselves into the position of, 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 of Sally. They don't understand what, what Sally knows about where the, where the ball is. And this is called a false belief task and, and the, 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 uh, the cognitive inferences that it uh, engages is called theory of mind. Now I had to, in, in order to test whether theory of mind was, was in any way involved, in my task, I had to use a, a theory of mind task, and I had to a task involve, involving narratives. So I did a second experiment. Uh, I did my Heiden Zimmer task again, and I created a theory of mind task. I, I created, I used story demands, sh short story with a, with a theory of mind component that I'll explain in a minute. And I used uh, control stories that are very, very, very similar to the theory of mind stories, but without the theory of mind co component. And uh, I, uh, the, the way I, I manipulated the narrative was I compared the control stories with unlinked sentences, which match content. Semantically, I'm, 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 I'm on that. So they, people couldn't form a narrative, in other words. They were just simple sentences that had nothing to do with one another. So I, I did not use the false belief task in my experiment. I sh I maybe, maybe I should have done that, because uh, everybody else does. Um, but I, I was a uh, bit of a cowboy, maybe. Uh, I, I thought that the false belief task is actually not really uh, so ecologically uh, valid, because uh, when do we ever have to decide where, where a ball is or where a piece of chocolate is or, 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 um, or, or, or the car keys are on the basis of what we, we inf infer is in somebody else's mind. So I, 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 I thought that a much more common theory of mind uh, um, task is in, in everyday communication. Uh, when we talk to, to one another, uh, we often mean more than we say. In, in order to understand what we actually mean, we need to understand, we actually have to have a lot, a lot of knowledge, we have to understand the situation right, and we have to be able to put ourselves into the position of the speaker. Now, uh, if, and this brought me all the way back to, the, uh, to my, my, my studies uh, of psychology at Humboldt University of Berlin, where I learned about the, the four sides of a message model by, by, by somebody called Schultz von Thun. And he um, <coughs> explained his model on the basis of this statement here. When the husband says, and this is a very old-fashioned example, when the husband says at the table, <laughs> what, what is the green stuff of the soup? It can mean different things. And depending on the situation uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, uh, and the listener, uh, uh, you can read out several uh, several messages from this. Now, this is just uh, um, uh, you can hear it, you can you can understand it with your meta ear. He, he, he describes it that way. It just says there's some green stuff uh, in the soup. There's some some information is pushed from from, from the speaker to the to, to the receiver, and you know, that's it. But there could also be something meant with that. Now, that could be different things depending on how you tend to understand this message and what the relationship between the husband and the wife is. So uh, the self revealing. -reveal, so, so when you say when you say something like that, you're revealing something about yourself. Uh, so he wants to know what it is, or he or he does not like my soup. I, I'm revealing if I say something like that, I may not. I may not like the soup. You can also listen. You can also understand with your relationship here. Uh, he does not like my cooking complaints all the time, or uh, which is uh, it could also be appeal, right? Um, depending on how and in what kind of situation uh, it was said, how many times it was said before, it could be, it could be understood as he, either he wants me to tell him what it is, or don't put the green stuff in the soup again, cook better next time. 
<laughs> so um, <clears throat> I created stories that had uh, uh, they were they were like this short vignettes that had um, uh, a statement at the end of them that were either would, would either have this kind of uh, uh, a communic communicative intent component or not, and I asked people to, uh, to to answer questions at the event after they read the story of whether the uh, a particular statement was, was 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 correct or not, depending on the communicative intent that was was alluded in the story. Now, <clears throat> again, I wanted to I wanted to see whether theory of mind engages the anterior temporal lobes and. And if, 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 if their narration alone uh, engages the anterior temporal lobes. So this is a whole brain analysis. It's again just for just for display because all I did was again I did an RI, RI approach where I where I took the peak activations of the high densimal contrast in the anterior temporal lobe for each individual person uh, participant, and I ran a statistical test of the of the uh, of my theory of mind uh, 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 contrast within that area. And. Um, <clears throat> If you look here, first of all, theory of mind engages both anterior temporal lobes, and it's actually amazing. I was very surprised to see that in this whole brain, whole brain uh, analysis here on the FDR, voxelized FDR control, whole brain image, that the anterior temporal were actually the, 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 the most most robustly involved. I was very happy about that. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. So I got very lucky. I thought. So um, <clears throat> now the question is, do they overlap? The high and the animation in the theory of mind. Uh, Manipulation, right? And they do in the right anterior temporal lobe, but they don't. In, they don't in the left. Again, these kinds of these kinds of manipulation evoke activation on both sides, and uh, sometimes more on the left, sometimes more on the right. So in this case, it was the right anterior temporal lobe that was engaged, not so much the left. Uh, and this is my um, narrative manipulation. So this, I, I compared the stories that did not have here's mind component with the with the, with the stories with the unlinked sentences. To see whether whether a narration alone would have would have been able to explain the, the activation of the high and Zimmer animation in the anterior temporal lobe, and I didn't find anything in the, in the anterior temporal lobe at all. Actually, I found in the area the the, the, the posterior uh, STG SDS, the angular gyrus, the temporal parietal junction that uh, uh, Rebecca Sachs uh, uh, at MIT strongly believes to be to be the sole area of, of theory of mind inferences. Actually, I was uh, I was surprised to see that it's actually a narrative, not a theory of mind uh, 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 comparison that that, that shows in this area. So uh, you can believe what you want about what what really goes on back there. I think it's it's a, it's a, it's a language rather than an inferential cognitive uh, process. But this was not what I really wanted to test. I wanted to see whether that was going on. So this is the summary for experiment two. The theory of mind story is about. Uh, um, Activation of the anterior temporal lobes. This activation overlapped with activation of the hyoid zimmer tasks in the right anterior temporal lobes, somewhat in the left, and no uh, effects were found in the, in, the, in the narrative comparison. And the conclusions are the formation of narratives is not a likely explanation for ATL engagement in the hyoid zimmer task. Uh, and uh, according to the theory of mind hypothesis, the activity in the right anterior temporal lobes evoked by hyoid zimmer animations is at least in parts evoked by theory of mind process. So it could be that that the that the in, in, in higher zimmer animations uh, the, the activation of the ITM temple is due to theory of mind process. Now we have to see what kind of process it actually is. But because theory of mind the, 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 the theory of mind contrast in the false belief task and the mind task involves more than just an inference. It, it involves also access to social semantic knowledge, where we are back at my original hypothesis. And my proposal, or our proposal, is actually that, the, uh, that in, 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 in typical theory of mind contrast, we see again the medial prefrontal gyrus, the, the uh, um, cortex, the, the uh, temporal prior junction, and the anterior temporal lobes, and they're, 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 they're probably doing different things. And I believe that that is actually the access to social semantic knowledge that is, that is, that is the reason why the anterior temporal lobes activate. And uh, the inferences uh, involved with theory of mind process may, may go on elsewhere. Um, so I want to take you. I don't know how much how long I'm doing this time actually. I'm 15 minutes in. No. Mm -hmm. Really? You should still have 15 minutes. Okay. Good. Uh, uh, okay. This is actually a, this is a little bit of a, a science. This is not published. This, I did it actually a bit more more for myself. So I was thinking a little bit further, 
And I was, I was worried that these social concepts, and these words that, that we use, and those non-social concepts, co concepts, may actually be a bit more related to one another, uh, semantically a bit more similar than the non-social concepts. And if something, at least in theory, something is more similar, it may evoke cortical real estate in a little bit more of a reliable manner than, than things that are more unrelated to one another. So I was wondering uh, on how to, how to attack this. So how can we find out if social concepts were overall more closely related? Um, and, and what people often do in order to, to uh, <clears throat> derive at a, a pictorial uh, picture of interrela semantic interrelations of, of, of concepts, they, they, they let people judge the similarity of word pairs. And when you have these similarity relations of, of many, many different word pairs, you can, you can, you can actually uh, depict them in, 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 a, in a spatial relation. And this is uh, the, the procedure that is, that is performed for multi-dimensional scale. But in order to get those similarity relations, similarity relations you have to get the, 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 the distance or adjustment for each individual pair, which is a lot of work. I used a lot of work for, uh, words for my, uh, uh, for, for my task. So asking people to do that would have been absolutely uh, undoable. So, <clears throat> actually, just to show you here, uh, they did this, they did, uh, the way this can work with multidimensional scaling. They did this in kids, they, they gave uh, 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 adults and kids words of body parts, and they let them judge how related they are from one, uh, to one another. And you see, these are the kids here, you have the body, you have the head, the face, the mouth, the cheeks, so these are fairly closely related to one another, and then the elbow, the hand, the arm are. But if you look at the, what, what distinguishes the, um, the the, the adult model here from the, from, the, from, from the children's model is the fact that the leg and the arm are actually closer together and the knee and the elbow are closer together. And this is presumably because adults have formed a concept uh, as, uh, uh, on the basis of the similarity between a leg and the arm, which, which means it is a limb. So for us, a leg and an arm is, is closer related than for kids because we have a concept of a limb. Uh, just, just for you to see the, show the, the, the beauty of it, uh, actually. So how did, I, how did I tackle this problem? I didn't want to ask people for, to make similarity relations on my, on my words. So, so there's something that's called codes. Does anybody know this? Correlated Occurrence Analog to Lexical Semantics. So what people did, and I forgot who it was, it's been longer ago that I did this, and it was a little bit more of a side note, but I just want to show you because I kind, of, I kind of found it cool. They have found out that if you let, if you if you take um, uh, uh, information, text, correspondence from the internet, and you, um, you you basically measure the distance between certain words, like say arm and leg, in in how many words are in between, then you can derive a distance measure. Yeah. And if you compare this to a similarity uh, rating by by, um, by 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 real participants, they, they are very very highly correlated. With so you can use the, the how closely words or terms or concepts are in, in correspondence in the internet, for instance, as a model for how, they, how closely they relate they are in meaning in, 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 in everyday, in, 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 in judgment of uh, in, in, in experiment. Yeah. So I use this as a, as a crutch, in other words. Um, <clears throat> so again, semantically similar words are more likely to occur together in everyday communication. Codes is a word corpus that contains intercorrelations of words. Semantic similarity, similarity can be assessed via this, via this co-occurrence. And uh, I, I, I fed, there's, a, there's an, an online site that lets you feed you the words that you're interested in, or, or the relations between the words that you're interested in, into, into, that, into that program, and it spits you out uh, uh, se semantic similarity or distance uh, values. And then you can, I fed those into my, my multidimensional scaling model, and I could, this was the way to, to, um, to picture the distances between my words. So these, now these, you can do that many different ways, you can organize, you know, now words can, can organize in semantic similarity uh, uh, along several dimensions, right? So I was interested to see if I, if I, if I create a very uh, simple two-dimensional uh, model here of those, those words, and, 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 and uh, uh, where, how do I find my words? Maybe, Remember, my original question was, are those social words more closely related to one another? And here, here are my social words. Uh, an example, just a few of them. Respectful, selfish, eager, unstable. And here are my control words. Poisonous, endangered, nutritious, trainable. First of all, 
you, you can see here that they organize uh, in distance on, on, on a balance dimension, good, good versus bad. And it is my, I was somewhat happy to see that they seem to organize also in terms of, uh, in terms of whether they're social or not social. So I was more I was more convinced that my that, that the that my social works were actually social in a sense they were similar in a social sense, and uh, what made me also happy was the fact that it looked like the social works were actually semantically more unrelated than the than the than, than the control works. Remember, I thought that may have been a confound, right? That the, that uh, we only see uh, differences between social and non-social works because they engaged cortical cortical areas with more reliability because they are, they are, they are more closely related. This, I was just playing with it, I just wanted to show, it, wanted to show you this because I, I found this, uh, this, this, this option to go to, 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 uh, to explore semantics that were uh, quite exciting. Um, <clears throat> so here, quick, um, uh, quick conclusion, social concepts may exist as a semantic category. Uh, social concepts are very diverse in regards to their meaning. But uh, topographic differences in my, my FMI data are uh, probably not confounded by semantic similarity. And this is my first part of the talk. And I'm going to go through the second part of my talk very quickly because I see that I only have a few minutes left. Um, <clears throat> we also used a stimulation technique on the anterior temporal lobes based on the findings that, um, that uh, the anterior temporal lobes are involved in. in Naming of, of, of predominantly people. So we wanted to explore whether we can move performance around uh, depending on whether we stimulate the anterior temporal lobes with, uh, with, with, with electricity. So this is a, a, I introduced this technique briefly at the beginning. It's called transcranial direct current stimulation. And what happens is you know this is not our setup. But what you do is you, you, you have, you have a, an, an anode and a cathode. And you can direct current through the that, that goes through the skull and, uh, uh, and, and, and through the brain. Um, very very minor current, but uh, this has been shown in, in head models and in animal models to affect uh, uh, the uh, resting membrane potentials, uh, and therefore uh, increase the, or decrease the likelihood of, of neural firing. And people have been exploring this for for new rehabilitative purposes. And uh, they have now begun to see whether it has uh, also uh, effect on, 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 on perform um, performance on cognitive and memory tasks and so on. So I mentioned this, that lesions in the anterior temples can cause an ability to name familiar people. Proper naming is disproportionately affected in normal aging. Now, this is this is uh, another motivation why, why, why we did this, is that uh, in, 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 in healthy normal aging, uh, there is a mild uh, cognitive decline, and it oftentimes shows first when people are trying to get proper names. And why proper names? Because pro proper names are actually arbitrary. If I, if I needed to, to, to name an object or uh, uh, call a butcher a butcher, then I can access this term from 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 very very different side from the way he looks from the from what he does and so on and so on. But the proper name is arbitrary. There's no reason why my name is Lars. You can you you can think of you have to actually remember it. this uh, this arbitrary connection this unique arbitrary connection makes it very very hard for people to access. And we we thought that that we we, we may be able to uh, <coughs> to change performance uh, with with TDCS, but because one one idea is that in aging the neural connectivity actually increases. In a, in a very mild uh, way. So what we did, we did this in, 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 uh, in uh, young controls first. We presented uh, uh, pictures of faces and of famous faces and, and, and pictures of, of famous landmarks, and uh, we stimulated over the left uh, and the right anterior temporal for about 15 minutes with uh, with uh, with, uh, with, uh, with 1.5. Milliamps, we had a left anterior temporal lobe, right anterior temporal lobe in sham conditions, 15 subjects, and the task was to name the face and the place as fast as possible. And uh, before you look at this, let me tell you the first and last did show nothing. Absolutely nothing. No difference at all. And then I thought, well, you know, in most cases, people either know or don't know the person or the landmark. So the response will be very, will be very, very quick. So how about, how about if I just isolate conditions where people took a little bit longer? 
it's much more likely that, that, that this current simulation will affect situations when the name is not immediately accessible. And so I chose all, all the trials, correct trials that had, a, or all, all trials that had an accuracy, sorry, a reaction time of more than five seconds. And here it was. Um, this is the sham condition here. People got, for these trials, about 25% correct. This is the, 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 the left and lower simulation here, and this is the right and lower simulation. And this difference was significant. And while, while I was surprised to see what this, it was actually the other way around for places. So it seemed to have a, a, a similar spe specific uh, effect, uh, right versus left uh, simulation. And here is just uh, the, the, right, the, the simulation on the right side, the individual subjects and the amount of improvement, just to show that it was, it was, it was a fairly consistent, fairly consistent thing. These two subjects actually uh, did, did, did not show any increase in performance in any kind of simulation. So they were special. These were the only two where, where simulation uh, decreased performance in, 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 all, in, in all conditions. So the right and left simulation enhances the recall of proper names, uh, we concluded. Um, and this is the case, especially in situations when the access to the name is difficult. Um, this effect may be specific to names of people. Now there are a bunch of uh, caveats here. There is a very, very precise spatial resolution. Now, we didn't only stimulate the anterior temporal lobes. The current, the current distributes, I, I showed you, I told you that the inferior frontal gyrus and, and Broca's area are very, very involved in, 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 uh, in, in uh, uh, word production and semantic access and so on. So it could be that it's not the ITNs at all, but, but other, other regions. It could be a, a recognition uh, effect. So uh, there's, a, there's a long chain of processes that lead to the actual recall of a name. We have, to, uh, we have to visually identify that person. We have to activate what we know about the person. And then at the end, at the end of this uh, supposedly serial process comes the actual access from a, to the phonological material. So, so it may have been a recognition effect rather than a, a, an actual uh, phonological access effect. Um, and Still, there is, there is actually the possibility that, they, that, that they were, uh, they were, these effects were actually strategic uh, because of, 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 of current leakage to, 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 to frontal areas. Now, um, I mentioned that we, are, we were interested in, in looking at uh, uh, naming performance and, and, and stimulation in elderly subjects. We did the same task in, in older uh, participants with the difference that, I, that we used uh, uh, faces of people and, 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 and images of places that they actually knew. So we had to go back and we had to pick famous places, uh, Marilyn Monroe and all these you know, famous old uh, actors. And we, we tried to isolate um, <clears throat> uh, stimuli that actually took a little bit longer for them to name. Because these are the typical tip of the tongue items, right? So these are all the participants. This is performance in faces. This is sham condition. This is the right condition, this is the left condition. You see here there is a, again, only with longer reaction times. Now there is an effect here, but it's the other way around. So, yeah, I was, I was, uh, I was very surprised to see that. And then in places, actually, places doesn't decrease performance, it increases performance. So here I just drew the effect out. Here, here, here's the performance in faces. This is simulation over the right side or the left side for old. And for, for young people, in both in, in both groups, there is an increase for faces, but it, it, it's stronger on, on, on different sides. And uh, the difference in places here, this here becomes more apparent. There is an improvement in older adults and a, and a, and a, and a decline in, in an overall decline in in, uh, in, um, in younger. So why is that now? Well, I can't I can't really tell you. I can only speculate. Uh, one, one speculation is that there is some form of cortical reorganization in aging. People have shown that the typical uh, hemispheric asymmetry that we see in younger, um, in, in, in younger adults uh, reduces in, in, in aging, and it's possible that, uh, that the contralateral, there's more recruitment of contralateral hemispheric areas due to mild cognitive de de decline. Just a speculation. The, another possibility would be that, there are that the differences in stimulus material, which are, which are way, way older, which may, may uh, involve more uh, uh, um, uh, um, episodic access. Uh, 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 something, I mean, these are faces and faces that you learn, maybe, 
maybe 40, uh, sometimes 50 years ago, it is possible that the access to material that was learned that, that early on uh, engages uh, the, the temporal ropes differently than, than, than in younger ones. And still, um, there is there's a possibility, and this is what, what, what I'm betting on, that in the young, there was actually a recognition effect on the right side, which is in line with, with imaging studies that showed that person recognition in, in, involves more the right uh, hemisphere than the, than the left. And that it is a, a matter of phonological axis in the world. So the typical tip of the tongue situation, where you, where you have, where you know the face, you have identified the person, you can describe what this person does, you have access to all the semantic material, just not the name. Uh, that that actually, the TVCS moves that around in, in, in order, in, in order of um, um, subjects. And that's it, uh, about exactly an hour, and according to my clock at least. Uh, I want to thank Henry Olson, my former supervisor, David Wolf that I'm collaborating with on the TCS projects uh, and, uh, in, at the University of uh, Pennsylvania, as well as Branch Constant, and this was our tech who ran most of the subject, David McCoy. Uh, thank you very much for your. Uh,